You are muted, Bas. Right. That is me after lunch here. Brain working slowly, so be patient. Um, so hello, everyone. Thank you for, for coming uh, to this uh, in-depth session. I think it's going to be super in-depth because we're not that many, so we will be able to speak um, uh, maybe, I don't know, like better, like hopefully Robert and Melissa will be able to, to talk, but if not, we only have the, we always have the written option. So uh, the usual things we have to say is um, we have a code of conduct, so uh, follow it. You all know about it, but it's basically to be be nice to yourself and to everyone else. And why we did this session or we organized this session, um, we asked mentors what themes or topics would be good to cover in depth. Um, we didn't ask the uh, participants or the mentees because we were asking a lot of things those days. So we didn't want to uh, overwhelm them with questions. Uh, but also because the mentors that they, they have a good kind of sense of, of what the struggles uh, their mentees have. So um, this uh, this session is going to be recorded. So is being recorded. Uh, so the idea is that, and, and often happens that uh, participants do um, check what, uh, I mean, check the previous cohort calls. This is the last one if I'm not mistaken or wrong, uh, Irene, uh, uh, of the year. So is a, uh, yeah, um, wow, it went away, 2023. Okay, and we have a very good speaker. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna shut up. <laughs> uh, so Rachel has uh, more uh, more time to talk to us and, and then we, we open the, the conversation and the discussion. Um, I'm gonna let Rachel introduce herself. Um, she will do it better than me. Uh, and also because I get nervous when there's a camera recording. Um, and well, again, thank you, Melissa, Robert, uh, Virginia, uh, Irene, and Rachel for being here. And let's start. Amazing. Thank you so much um, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, let me take that moment to share my presentation. Can everybody hear me OK? All good? Perfect. So um, I have been invited to talk to you today about how to run effective and inclusive meetings and get community input. Uh, my name is Rachel Ainsworth. I'll talk a bit more about myself on the next slide. But um, I just wanted to start by, you know, kind of talking about what inclusive meetings are and why they're important. But basically, inclusive meetings ensure diversity of representation, voices, opinions, and ideas, and they create a safe space where everybody feels empowered to share those ideas. Um, Open Life Science and the Open Seeds program are exemplars of effective and inclusive meetings. So I feel a bit funny, a bit of, of like an imposter for, you know, coming here and telling you things that you probably already know and have experience with, but hopefully afterwards you'll feel more empowered to running your own meetings by, you know, recognizing that you do a lot of this um, just by being in this cohort. Um, so a bit about me, I am currently a product manager for data services at Kraken, which is part of the Octopus Energy Group, which is working to, you know, disrupt the energy sector and move it more towards renewable energy and fighting climate change. Um, I am a fellow of the Software Sustainability Institute, and I also run a women in data meetup group um, here in Manchester. Uh, previously, I was an academic. Um, I was a community manager for the Software Sustainability Institute for four years um, and based at the University of Manchester um, here in the UK. I was also a work package lead for the UK um, Square Kilometre Array Regional Centre project. So that was basically a big um, data centre project for a new telescope that's being constructed. Um, and I was also um, an open research advocate and astrophysical research um, before that. So. That's a bit about me. I've got um, quite a broad background, but um, I've organized quite a few different types of meetings in the past, you know, ranging from small, you know, focus groups all the way up to big conferences, um, you know, to bring communities together to, to share their ideas. So hopefully I can provide some insight for you today. Um, so I've broken this down um, to, you know, what to do before the meeting, what to do during the meeting and what to do after the meeting. Um, but, you know, Preparation is key. 
Um, often when we're in a rush or we do things at the list last minute, we tend to do things that are the easiest for us, which is when our personal biases can automatically kick in and take over. Um, so that's why it's really crucial to you know make sure you um, schedule plenty of time to prep for the meeting. Um, and you should still prepare you know everything that I mentioned today that takes place during and after the meeting ahead of time. Um, and another way to avoid our personal biases and blind spots impacting um, our meetings is to include other team members or trusted community uh, community members for feedback every step of the way. So um, you know, even if you're, you know, just getting started with a project and you're doing things on your own for now, you know, bringing in at least another set of eyes to look over your, um, to look over your proposed ideas for the meeting is is really good way to try and avoid biases. And we'll we'll tackle some of those things throughout this talk as well. So before the meeting. Um, I personally think that the first step towards organizing effective and inclusive meetings is to identify the goals, objectives, and desired outcomes of the meeting, as this will guide the decisions made around, you know, who to invite, how to prioritize agenda items, and the format of the meeting. So for example, your project team may have received a feature request that they need to understand the requirements for, or have a discovery session to scope out the work, identify potential challenges, and propose solutions. Or perhaps you have a product or process that you would like community feedback from in order to make you know, improvements before you iterate on it or take the next step. So you know, whether your goals are around brainstorming, project planning, decision making, or reflection, um, they're really important for keeping the meeting focused and within scope and also for you know, avoiding the, it could have been an email situation. Um, so once you've identified the goals of your meeting, you can then do everything else. So you can identify who to invite in order to achieve those goals and outcomes. So if you need a more nuanced discussion to achieve your goals, then it's a really good time to invite community members to a meeting. Um, but if you can achieve your goals with, you know, simple responses or yes, no answers, um, then you can gather that kind of feedback through a survey or a poll of your community. Um, when deciding on who to invite, representatives from you know, key stakeholder groups, decision makers, user groups, use cases, and people with different backgrounds and perspectives should be included. Um, the number of meeting participants should be small enough to allow for discussion and to hear everyone's views, but large enough to make sure you, um, that you have that uh, diverse range of perspectives and experiences. It does require uh, preparation and research to identify the representative cross-section of your community to invite. But again, this will be driven by the goals um, that you want the meeting to achieve. And then once you have identified you know, who should be attending the meeting, uh, you'll need to decide on the meeting format based on their needs and requirements. So if you're a localized group, um, everyone might prefer to meet in person. Um, but if the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us anything, it's that um, you know, the most inclusive and accessible meetings uh, are remote. Um, although hybrid meetings are now kind of typically expected from community organizers. Um, if you have participants meeting in person, then you'll need a venue. If you have participants joining remotely, then you'll need a video conferencing tool. Um, but regardless of what meeting format uh, you decide, you know, make sure that you gather all of your participants, um, you know, requirements, whether that's accessibility requirements or anything else, um, and their preferences uh, when you invite them so that you can tailor the meeting format accordingly. You will also need to consider participants' needs when scheduling the meeting. So you can use um, a polling tool such as Doodle or Meet to collect participant availability. Um, regional, religious, and school holidays should be taken into account, you know, along with time zones and caring responsibilities. Um, and then some considerations around recurring meetings. You could have um, a consistent meeting time so that participants are able to plan ahead and attend as many of the meetings as possible. However, this could exclude some members that have a permanent clash with that meeting time. Um, so an alternative is to, you know, have, you know, changing or alternative meeting times um, where you poll um, members, you know, for their availability for each meeting and then arrange, you know, to accommodate uh, different people um, at different times. But this can have a significant overhead. So um, do what's best for, for your community. I would say that kind of Either way, it's extremely unlikely that you'll be able to accommodate everyone all of the time. Um, even last minute illnesses or personal circumstances can impact a person's attendance. So that's why it's also really important to um, uh, allow people to contribute asynchronously, asynchronously um, which we'll talk more about in a minute. 
Um, but I just, before I move on to the next slide, I just want to highlight again that it, it is very important to avoid making any decisions on any of these items um, in isolation, um, if possible, um, because that's where an individual's biases and blind spots can create exclusion, um, however unintentional it may be. So, you know, bouncing, you know, um, a date and time off of, of somebody else in the community, you know, they might be able to flag if it is a religious holiday in a different culture or something like that, and then you can, um, you can rearrange. Um, the next uh, piece of advice is to establish a meeting code of conduct if your community doesn't already have one. Um, so, you know, decide on which behaviors you will deploy your full code of conduct enforcement for, you know, such as removing somebody um, from the meeting if they are harassing others um, versus which behaviors do not count as misconduct, but for which you'll need to prepare to interrupt. Um, so an example of, an, of a behavior that is disruptive, but not necessarily misconduct, is speaking over others. Um, I like to go into these situations in good faith. You know, people are likely very excited or enthusiastic to contribute their ideas. Um, but it is a good idea to have some phrases prepared, um, you know, ahead of time to swiftly manage those kinds of interruptions. You know, for example, um, you know, let's say Paz interrupted me here. I'll, you're interrupted, you know, um, Melissa speaking. I can just, you know, say, oh, thanks, Paz. You know, we'll come back to this in just a moment. But let's, you know, finish hearing Melissa's thoughts on this before we move on. Um, that could be an example um, phrase that you can prepare ahead of time to, to manage that situation. Um, but you should crucially have a procedure or a protocol in place for how you will manage misconduct um, so that everyone knows what to do if the situation arises, because it can be, you know, quite scary when that happens. And if you, you know, you don't have a checklist of things that you need to do and also make that visible to your participants, then it can be very difficult to manage in the situation. Um, but a lot of the skills that you learned during your ally skills workshop can you know, be really highly valuable for how you create a psychologically safe space for your participants. And one way to mitigate a lot of um, disruption and run an effective and inclusive meeting is to communicate what to expect um, very clearly to your participants ahead of time, you know, such as sharing that code of conduct and expected behaviors. Uh, communicating Oh, oh, there it is. Communicating um, the goals, desired outcomes, and topics for discussion will also provide further context and purpose of the meeting and keep it focused. And providing a more detailed and collaborative agenda or notes document will further help participants to prepare what they'd like to say um, and also contribute items to cover um, in writing. And this can make it a lot easier for more you know, introverted members of the group to share their contributions. Um, and of course, OLS um, is, you know, the perfect example of this. We've got a meeting notes document and agenda here. I was able to look at it ahead of time and I knew exactly what to expect when I arrived today. Um, and then finally, um, ways to uh, uh, contribute asynchronously should be communicated ahead of time as well. So that, you know, for those participants who can't make it at, you know, perhaps the last minute or could never make it at all, they'll still feel included every step of the way and they can still contribute talking points to the meeting even if they um, aren't able to be there. So um, some things to uh, do during the meeting to keep it inclusive and effective. Um, and again, um, all of these things um, are better prepared for ahead of time. Um, but during the meeting, it's all about how you facilitate it um, so as to empower everyone to engage. Um, so for efficiency, it's really good to have assigned meeting roles, um, such as a chair or a facilitator, um, who will keep the meeting on time and on topic. So we've got Paz and Irene here who are going to keep me on time and on topic, um, along with a designated note taker, um, I find is really helpful in meetings, especially where decisions need to be made, or if a lot of people um, are having a, a discussion. Um, and then other uh, other meeting members can also feel empowered to contribute if it's a collaborative document as well. Um, at the start of the meeting, uh, the facilitator can set the tone by reminding attendees about the code of conduct, any rules or expected behaviors, you know, such as staying on mute when not speaking or using the raise hand function to speak, and also remind everyone of the goals of the meeting. Um, inviting uh, participants to introduce themselves adds additional context to the perspective that they bring and can also act as a way to break the ice. 
And I personally find it really helpful to say to stay synchronized in meetings by by using those collaborative agenda and notes documents. Um, like I said, which is also really common practice here in OLS. Um, so if people you know join the meeting late or have to leave early, um, they can jump in exactly at the right time and, and get up to speed with with what everybody else is doing and, and the conversation that's been had so far. Um, a common complaint about hybrid meetings is that remote participants often feel less included or often forgotten. So some ways to prevent this include, you know, taking a remote first approach, you know, such as asking remote participants uh, to answer a question first, um, you know, making sure that in-person speakers look at the camera, speak into the microphone, um, things like that, and ensuring that any questions are asked um, in a microphone as well and, and any side conversations um, are shared. Um, and of course, if necessary, um, using those prepared phase, uh, phrases for interrupting any disruptive behavior. Um, some other um, things that I kind of think might be helpful to keep the meeting um, on topic could be to provide, you know, an AOB, um, which is in any other business section um, or parking lot space in the notes document for off agenda topics so that people can still contribute them without maybe going, um, bringing the discussion off on a tangent. Um, and then something else that I saw while I was preparing for this talk that I haven't tried myself, but looked really interesting um, was building in a devil's advocate time on your agenda, um, which I thought might be a really good way to um, kind of answer that question I got around challenging our internal biases to lead meetings more effectively. You know, you could, you know, provide, you know, five to 10 minutes to encourage everyone to identify problems, challenges, issues, unintended con consequences, et cetera. Um, to make sure that those kinds of, um, you know, competing thoughts are, are voiced and, and um, addressed. Um, so more ways that we can get um, everybody invited uh, to contribute their ideas and have their, and have their voices heard um, through good facilitation is, you know, by providing multiple pathways for contributing. Um, participants who are present during the meeting may prefer to voice their opinions, while others may prefer to write them down. Um, it's a really good idea not to put people on the spot, um, but make sure that everyone still has the opportunity sh to show their views. For the participants who couldn't make the meeting, um, recording and transcribing the meeting could be a good way to help them get up to speed um, and feedback over email or in the notes. Um, but if there are reasons, you know, not to record the meeting, then taking detailed meeting notes for um, asynchronous uh, participants to catch up with are crucial. So again, all come as standard as part of OLS programming. Um, however, there are times when people may prefer to share their views anonymously, such as when voting on a decision. Um, so providing an anonymous poll or survey are two ways to gather this kind of information. Um, but it is also extremely valuable to empower people to have ownership of their contributions and to credit them, to help them, you know, with their own personal and professional growth. Um, and this also comes from cultivating a um, psychologically safe environment. And then finally, um, at the end of the meeting, identifying any next steps and assigning actions um, and including any timelines or deadlines. This really helps to maintain momentum on the project and manage participant expectations. And then after the meeting, um, again, really important to acknowledge credit and thank participants for their attendance, contributions and input. You, you know, when you wanna give them um, value for attending the meeting, you know, they've spent valuable time preparing for it and contributing their ideas. So you want to make sure that they're properly acknowledged and rewarded um, after the fact and credited for their ideas. Um, it's good to follow up and communicate meeting outcomes, um, any follow-up actions and next steps. And if there were any questions that were raised during the meeting that couldn't get answered during the meeting, um, it's good to kind of follow up with those answers so that um, people don't feel ignored for asking them. Um, sharing meeting notes um, and resources, um, such as links to the agenda, the notes documents, the recording, and ways to contribute asynchronously if they couldn't attend in person um, or, or synchronously. And then asking for feedback is really good. So, you know, we've put in all of that preparation before our meeting, we've talked to our trusted community members or our organizing committee to, you know, try and identify as many biases or blind spots and, and ways to mitigate them and avoid them in the meeting. But 
um, you know, we're human, we're not perfect, there might still be ways that we can improve. So asking your community um, directly for feedback is a really good way to then improve um, for the next meeting. And then of course, restart the process all over again um, if you have recurring meetings. Um, so that's kind of a whistle stop um, tour of um, ways to run inclusive and effective meetings. Um, I'm hoping we get a lot of really good questions so that we can dis discuss stuff in more detail and maybe do a deep dive on other things. Um, as I was preparing this, I found a few resources, um, so I've added them in here. But of course, Open Life Science is an exemplar for um, running inclusive events and uh, meetings in particular. So um, they've kind of guided a lot. They've guided a lot of you know the ways that I run meetings um, and are, are really, really um, great at providing, you know, open source resources and um, tutorials and things like that on, on how to gain skills in doing this. Um, and I also just wanted to specifically highlight the Ally Skills workshops. Um, I think what you learn in those workshops will really help you in, you know, interrupting disruptive behavior during, during a meeting, if that is to happen or to, you know, make sure your participants feel as welcome and included as possible. Uh, so I'll end there and I'm very happy to, to start the discussion and answer any questions. Oh, let me stop um, sharing. Yeah, thank you so much, Rachel. He's, yeah, um, I personally liked um, very much a few points, but I'm not gonna, I mean, let's others first um, share any any ideas or, or questions that I have. Oh, and you can you can put in your name if you prefer to write uh, or just write in the chat or in the pad. Um, Melissa, Virginia, uh, Robert, I imagine you are at work or something. So uh, also because we're recording this. But anyways, let us know. We do have if, a couple of questions uh -huh. in, okay. the, in the pad. So we're going to start with those uh, while you think of other questions. And the first is how to ask for feedback in ways to uh, that avoid confirmation bias. Um, and one way is to make it anonymous, uh, but do you have any other recommendations to do that? Yeah, that's really good. Um, you, so yeah, I think from the, what was, oh, sorry, let me read it again, ask for feedback, making it anonymous is one way. I think just providing a really safe environment for people to be able to speak their minds. Um, in a recorded situation, people might not feel as comfortable sharing, um, you know, if it's a, if it's a competing view that they, that they want to share. So, so that's why I kind of identified that, you know, it's not always possible to record meetings and why meeting notes can be really helpful and, and keep keep contributions anonymous if people don't want their name attributed to something but being really frank and open and transparent about things you know maybe just staying out loud you know what am, what are we missing here what have we not um you know seen what are you know what are ways that um you know we can we can challenge the assumptions that we've made so far um, yeah, I think just just being really open and, and honest and authentic, but creating that safe space for, for people to feel like they can um, share competing views. Um, how to ask for feedback in ways that avoid confirmation bias. Does that answer your question? Does anybody else have any suggestions or experience with this? Because it can be quite difficult, you know, when we're organizing a meeting to you know, sometimes it, it is really easy without too much preparation to, you know, invite people who, who already kind of have similar views to you. So if we want to avoid that, that's why I suggest putting in plenty of time ahead of time to make sure that you get that uh, diverse range of perspectives to, to avoid that situation. But I'd be curious to hear any other advice people have around that or experience. I, I was thinking of um, about OLS um about regarding this specific question and um like all is perceived as as you as you said rachel like a very welcoming community and and i wonder if that might play i mean that might make us a bad favor at some point like in in the sense of uh 
uh, stopping people from uh, voicing their, their concern, uh, concerns or, or criticism about how few things or some things are are communicated or, or done. Um, so actually I put the second question, which was like how to how to respond to feedback. <laughs> um, and anyways, but I, I was thinking that it might be tricky also like in communities that also offer programs like open seats for, for free and uh, to get very honest uh, kind of contributions or or ideas. This is just a thought um, more than yeah. another thing. Yeah. It requires Melissa, building a lot of trust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Melissa, I wonder if you can, I don't know if you can talk, but I wanted to ask you about your experience with other other online communities. Um, and if you've, I don't know, witnessed, uh, I don't know, situations that like, for example, in OLS, I never, I never heard any criticism in in cohort calls, <laughs> or later after. So, I wonder if that is a problem. <laughs> is, um, uh, yeah, I don't want to put you on the spot, Melissa, but I'm curious. Hmm. Honest feedback with kindness too. Yaps, yeah, hello. Hi, the hand. Go ahead, Virginia. Hi. Yes, actually, Melissa answered through the chat. I know if you saw it, uh, that she agrees with what you're saying, but <laughs> and that it is feedback should come with kindness too. For from my perspective of someone who is coming to OLS meetings and things like that. I do think OLS, as Rachel mentioned, deals with a lot of these issues of being as inclusive as possible. I mean, we are really few people of the total of the cohort because the, of the time schedule. So that that it's an issue, but things are in the YouTube channel. We have these other parts which everyone can join. I do think sometimes it, since we are being open, Maybe too much information or too many options can be a bit challenging for everyone to look out like, where should I go? For example, today I was struggling to find um, the link to the Etherpad, for example. <laughs> and I know you are very, very uh, neat and everything is there on the open or in the Slack or in the email or in the website. But I my, I can speak for myself. Um, in my case, maybe having too many options, it's a bit distracting. Uh, and in terms of the feedback, I always appreciate when questions are really simple and direct. I mean, like, do you like the time we gave for each activity? Do you like this and that activity? And I always appreciate uh, when everyone is, uh, when the people that are giving the talks and everything, um, are open about it and like welcome criticism openly, like please give us your feedback and not just saying like, oh, there's there, which I think you do, don't worry. There was actually a chat in the Slack where some things were raised about uh, the activities and the timelines and the languages and things like that. So I think there has been some <laughs> discussion about it. Maybe not everyone saw the chat. I think some of you uh, also interacted. But yes, there's so many things to consider. So uh, it's really nice to hear there's always room for improvement. But thank you for everything. <laughs> and that connects very nicely with the last question. Um, I, I'm skipping one question, but we can go back to that one. Um, I wanted to connect this with the question about how to ensure representation in a meeting without overburdening community members. So Rachel, you have mentioned the importance of involving community members at every step, but then as Virginia was saying, having too many options can also be a burden. Absolutely. And um, a lot of the time, especially when you have maybe a large cohort or a large community, usually, you know, 
um, a few people might be contributing all of the time and, and that's what can lead to, to their burnout instead of maybe a more steady, consistent contribution. Um, I would say that if you do have community members who very much want to volunteer their time, you know, make sure that you really value that, um, you know, people usually volunteer for things for different reasons, if they want to gain a skill or if they're really passionate about something and you also don't want to, you know, put them off or, you know, disempower them by not um, including them if they have the time available to give. Um, but at the same time, you also don't want to give them too much so that they do burn out. So really kind of balancing that um, and being respectful of their time and making sure that you credit and acknowledge them for all of their hard work. Um, but you also want to make sure that, you know, those select few aren't leading to that, you know, confirmation bias that we already talked about earlier. Um, you know, maybe maybe that group of people, you know, think similar things. And that's why they're all working really hard together to make all those contributions. And that's when it's a really good time to, you know, do that research into the community, identify community members who are doing really, really, you know, important and valuable work in different ways and in different areas and try and identify those, you know, diverse um, experiences, um, those diverse, you know, ways of thinking, different backgrounds in order to get that representation um, that you need in your meeting. But like I said at the start, it does require a lot of um, upfront preparation and research in order to get that right. So I really do think time is really kind of the most um, key factor when, you know, trying to, you know, get that representation from the right people without overburdening too many people. You do just have to, you do have to put in the time to, to get it right and do that research. Um, because otherwise, you know, if, if we wait till the last minute to organize a meeting, then we are going to immediately just automatically fall on those people who, who who come to us all the time or who we go to all the time. And then that's um, a surefire way to, to have people burn out. Um, I'll pause in case anybody wants to contribute to that. Or if you want to steer me back on track if I went the wrong direction with that. Maybe the, the question you skipped, Irene, is uh, we can ask it now. You want to do it better? Yeah, so <laughs> um, <laughs> it, again, it connects with this idea of how do you make sure that participants are actually engaging? And so how do you, what do you suggest for letting quiet participants speak their opinion? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think having those multiple pathways to contribute is a good one. So, you know, um, being able to type in the chat, you know, the question if, you know, they're not comfortable saying it out loud um, or, you know, maybe giving people um, a few minutes, you know, after, you know, hearing a, a topic for a discussion or hearing a question, giving people some time to reflect on how they might want to answer it before, you know, asking everybody to contribute their ideas. Because um, I personally really struggle with, you know, I think it's really important for, you know, the, the meeting facilitator or chairperson to keep an eye on who's um, speaking during the meeting and who's not. But, at the same time, I, I don't feel quite comfortable with calling out people who haven't spoken up necessarily. I think putting people on the spot can have the kind of adverse effect. And, and I know I'm kind of like a deer in headlights if that happens to me. So so making sure that, you know, people have a heads up if they're about to be asked a question, you know, you could say, oh, so the next, you know, topic for discussion during the meeting is, you know, code of conducts. I'm going to go around the group and ask everybody to share their views on, you know, such and such a thing. Um, maybe give a few minutes for people to reflect on that and then, you know, start calling on everybody to contribute those so that it's not, you know, targeted at any one person or, you know, calling out somebody if, if they're being quiet um, because, you know, people might be quiet for, for various reasons, you know, maybe they, um, you know, have, you know, family in the background or, you know, anything could be happening. So just being mindful of that and, and, and letting people contribute how is most comfortable for them. So something that OLS does that I really, really like is this, you know, identifying in your um, name here on Zoom, whether you prefer to write or speak. I think that's a really 
fabulous way of, you know, letting people say how they want to contribute to the conversation. Um, and just yeah, meeting people where they are, I think is really, really key. As, um, as maybe somebody, uh, I, I was gonna say, I'm not gonna call anybody out. Um, if there are any people here who prefer to write or, or um, their contributions instead of speaking, or if they do find it difficult to contribute verbally in a meeting, do you have any, um, any feedback uh, for meeting facilitators or, or hosts that they can take on board to improve meetings for you so that so that your con contributions can be can be heard. Irene or and everyone. Uh, so we do have the exercise of the breaker rooms. Are we going to do it or we do it one here and stop recording? What do you think is better? What do you all think is better? Maybe we could vote or no. I don't know. <laughs> now I'm I'm questioning all my. <laughs> anyway, there it is. Okay. So you're going to stop recording and do that? What do you think, Irene? Please be the boss today. <laughs> okay, yes, we can try uh, an exercise, improvise an exercise here. I will pause the recording. So um, we are back after the discussion that was not recorded. Um, and well, thank you so much, Rachel. I think you shared very good tips with all of us and um, good examples of how to respond to different scenarios. Uh, and thank you everyone who also joined uh, this last meeting of the year. Um, and especially thank you for joining at this uh, hour and at this day, um, so late in the year. So we have a few reminders um, for everyone participating in the program, uh, please remember to sign up for the graduation calls. Uh, Pass sent an email earlier in the week and you should choose a spot within three uh, different meetings. Um, so that's the first reminder. And the second is that OLS will be closed. Um, today is the last um, official day that we are um, here and I think I am going to be until Friday. Um, so if, if you have any last minute questions about graduations or about um, the activities coming back in the new year, um, just write us in the Slack. Um, and I think that's it. Anything else that's that I was missing? Now to have a good end of the year and better beginning of the next. Oh, how fast it went. Yeah, thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, fantastic. And thank you for the, all the talks you have online as well, because they are pretty good as well. I had a look before. Um, and, and yeah, Virginia, Maya, baby, and the baby. Uh, and Irene, thank you so much. And yeah, we'll see you hopefully very soon. And rest. Thank you for having me. It was lovely to meet you all. Thank you, Rachel.